Hey folks, today we're talking about cloud models in lesson 14 of CompTIA Network Plus. So these cloud models are basically a subdivision in the public cloud category. Please note the ones I'm about to list for you folks are not the only cloud models. These are simply the main ones. All right, so let's get on with it. The main cloud models you'll encounter are namely SAAS, which is short for Software as a Service. Then we have PAAS, which is short for Platform as a Service. And then we also have IAAS, which is short for Infrastructure as a Service. Now, all three of these cloud models I just listed here forms part of public cloud. They're all examples of public cloud. In other words, your stuff is pretty much completely somewhere else on someone else's property. It's just the amount of control you have over it that will vary depending on which one of these three or any other ones you actually ultimately go and choose. With cloud, you pretty much always relinquish some level of control. It's just a matter of how much, depending on which model you, of course, choose. This will obviously vary from person to person, and it's also going to vary from company to company. We all have our own unique needs and requirements, and the same can be said about companies. No two companies out there are the same. What works for one company or enterprise will not necessarily work for the next one. All right, so now we know what the three main cloud models are. But what exactly do they do and what's the difference between them? Well, let's take a closer look, starting with the first one we have here on our list. So, SAAS, we already know this is short for software as a service. With this cloud model, you pretty much have the least amount of control. Now, don't get me wrong, folks. I'm not saying you have no control. I'm simply stating that out of the three we listed earlier, you have the least amount of control with this specific model, if we have to do a comparison, that is. All right, so what exactly is this cloud model called software as a service? You might wonder to yourself. Well, you probably already guessed it. It's about software. And if you did, you'd be correct. The catch here, though, is the software is running somewhere else. It's not running on your local laptop or desktop or even your company servers. The same can be said about the actual installation, mind you. The software is also installed somewhere else on someone else's property. The software is not installed locally on your machines, nor does it run on any of your machines. It's not installed or running on any of your servers either. It's all happening somewhere else on someone else's property. You, for the most part, only have control over the applications and data. The software is centrally managed and hosted for the customer, which will usually be you, of course, or unless you are the person that's hosting this for someone else. You never know. You might actually end up working for one of these cloud providers. But generally speaking, and more realistically, you are going to be the customer most likely. So what is meant by this is someone else out there is hosting this software on behalf of you or your company. They installed it on their property. They are running it on their property. And you just get to access this somehow remotely in some sort of way. Pretty sweet deal, right? Basically, the maintenance and all that jazz is now someone else's problem. Not you or your company's problem anymore. It really keeps getting sweeter, doesn't it? Something else worth noting about this, though, is the software that the hosting provider hosts for you, whoever this hosting provider might be. It could be Microsoft, could be Amazon, could be whoever. The software they host for you, there's normally only like one version that they actually host there for you of that software. Now, don't get me wrong, it's normally a very decent version. It's always the latest of the latest version, but they only run this one version. So all of the customers are going to be running the same version. It's not normally a problem. I've never had this be a problem, but I just felt I should mention that for you guys so that you're at least aware of it. Mind you, a very well-known thing that a lot of folks use, which is actually a very good example of software service, is actually Office 365. I mean, nine out of 10 companies are using it. 
Depending on the license or subscription you have for this, you'll see it actually gives you access to software as a service via a web browser. This includes, but is not limited to things like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and the list goes on. So you can go and open them in a web browser. You can run them in a web browser. It's going to look like it's on your PC, but it's not. Those are not installed on your PC. They're not running on your PC, but yet you get to access them via the internet, via some means like a web browser. That is software as a service. Alrighty, the next type of cloud model we get is the PaaS, which of course stands for Platform as a Service. This specific cloud model is basically kind of sort of in the between the software as a service one, which we just discussed, and the infrastructure as a service, which is the next topic we're going to discuss. I suppose you can call this platform as a service a middle ground of sorts, if you want. So platform as a service provides an environment for buying, building, testing, deploying, and running software applications. This provider will do most of the bulk work for you, wherever you decide to make use of. You'll then just be able to kind of come in at the last minute and just reap the benefits of all of it. I'll give you guys a few examples towards the end of this topic. Now, with platform as a service, you still don't have direct access to any servers or any hardware, nor can you configure anything even remotely regarding those. The cloud provider does most of the work, like we said earlier. The infrastructure as a service model, which is up next, with that model, you at least have a little bit more control than what we have now. I mean, every one of these, you keep having a little bit more control. So software as a service is the least, Platform service is smack bad in the middle, so that's the middle ground. And an infrastructure service, that one you've got the most control. So you still won't be able to physically touch the hardware, like the servers and all that, but at least you can go and choose the hardware. But okay, we're kind of jumping the gun here, so let's leave that for once we get to that topic, the infrastructure service one. Now getting back to the topic at hand, with the current model, the provider installs, maintains all the stuff for you. It's still all, for the most part, their responsibility. You will have the ability to access the software and tweak it for the most part. But the actual maintenance with the background, the installation, and all that stuff you don't really want to go and do. I mean, let's face it, who wants to go and do that? None of that is your problem. None of that is your responsibility. Okay, so let's give you guys a couple examples since I said I would earlier. Um, I'm going to give you guys examples that I like to give my students. And these examples I've seen really helps with getting the message across. So hopefully that does the same for you guys. Imagine for a moment you're walking into a grocery store. Yeah, I'm not even joking. And in that store, you go to, let's say, the frozen veggie section. Because they pretty much all have a frozen veggie section somewhere. Now those frozen veggies, you'll find that they are generally pre-washed, pre-sliced, pre-mixed, pre-diced. Heck, they're even pre-frozen for crying out loud. Basically, almost all the work has been done for you, the customer. All you need to go and do with it is you just need to go and cook it now. So what we're saying here is you're still going to do some work. Don't get me wrong, but the amount of work you're going to do now versus what you could have been doing is a heck of a lot less. I mean, man, you could have gone home and had to go and pick vegetables first. Maybe you would have had to go and wash them first, peel them, slice them, dice them, and, you know, etc., etc., etc. It could have been a lot of work. Do you need to go and do any of that now? Nope. All you need to go and do is just take that product and go and cook it. That, folks, is a real-life example of platform as a service if you think about it, <laughs> let's give you another crazy one like that. The same fake store we just were in now, just a moment ago, you'll see that in that store, they quite often have these pre-made meals. I mean, it could be something like a lasagna. It can be a potato bag, you know, something of that regard. Um, it's mostly pre-made is what it is. All you need to do with that is you usually just go take it home. You pop it in a microwave oven. You maybe go put it in the oven, you know, for a couple of minutes and that's it. That meal is, for the most part, pre-made. You literally just need to go and heat it up in the microwave or the oven for a couple of minutes, maybe half an hour or an hour in some cases, depending on what you bought. That's another example, a crazy example of platform as a service in real life. 
It's a wacky example of platform service in force, so to speak, in real life. I know, crazy, right? Yet all of this crazy stuff is there to make our lives easier. The IT form of this, which is the actual topic at hand here, is no different. It's there to make your life easier. You know what? While we're giving examples here, let me quickly switch over to one of my real cloud platforms running in the background. I'm going to switch over to my Microsoft Azure subscription, which I have here. So let's go and show you guys that. A few moments later. All right, folks, here we are on my own personal Azure subscription. So Azure is Microsoft's cloud platform. Well, one of them, at least. You get many cloud providers out there. I mean, I mentioned Amazon earlier, I think. So Amazon likes to go and use AWS. Microsoft likes to go and use Azure. And there's, of course, many other cloud providers out there. So potato, potato, as long as you get the example, I think that's all that matters here. So on this cloud platform, you don't need to know how this works and what it all is, but I want to draw your attention to this menu we have here on the left. Microsoft calls this the navigation menu, it used to be called the hub. And in this menu, we've got access to some of the most basic cloud functions. There's many more, there's literally thousands. This is only some of the most common functions the average Joe, like me and you, would need. Now looking at this list, I'm going to point out some random examples. Let's say Azure Active Directory and SQL databases. So before we jump into that, with a normal Active Directory, for those folks that know what an Active Directory is, you would know you would normally first have to go and build a physical or a virtual server. You would then have to go and install server, the operating system on that server. Once you've done that, you will need to go and add something called a role on that server. The role you'll be adding is the ADDS role, which stands for Active Directory Domain Services. Once you've done that, you'll need to go and promote that domain controller and make a domain and all that. It really isn't rocket science, but what it is, is time consuming. Very, very time consuming. For all we know, this could take you hours, maybe even the whole day to get to that point where you actually have your domain up and running, all that. Now, if I come in here in the cloud on the Azure platform, there is Azure Active Directory. I'm going to go and click on that little weasel, give it a moment to open up. And here we go. I can now right off the bat go click there and make myself a user account in a group. Did I need to go and create myself a physical or a virtual server just now? No, I did not. Did I need to install the operating system server? Nope. Did I need to go and add a role of any kind? Nope. Did I need to go and promote the main controller? Nope. The only thing you may possibly have to go and do is just to go and link your own company domain here, which is not going to take that long. It's going to take like a minute or two just go and do that. Other than that, you can just right off the bat, jump in, create user accounts, create groups, and do whatever you would normally have done on premises. So this, believe it or not, is a real life example of platform as a service. So you can see I get to use this software being Active Directory, and I still have, you know, for the most part, control over the software now. I can control the software, but I didn't have to install the operating system or all of that nonsense in the background. I just get to reap the benefits here now in the day. Another example I can give you folks is if we go back to that list, the SQL one I spoke of. Traditionally, to get SQL, you'd have to go once again, build a physical or a virtual server, install yourself the server operating system. Eventually, you're going to get to a point where you have to install SQL server, and you're going to go and create yourself a default instance or a named instance, and the list goes on and on and on. Definitely not rocket science, but it's very time consuming. So now... If I were to go and click there, right off the bat, I can just go and create myself a database or upload a database. I do not need to go make a physical or a virtual server. I do not need to go and install server or install SQL, none of that. I can just jump in, make a new database and upload a database if I want to. The only thing it might take long here is to go and upload a database because let's face it, those things are never small. They're humongous in size, but the amount of work you're going to be doing is minimal. You're going to go click upload and you can go make dinner, you can go watch a movie, you can do whatever. And eventually when you get back one day, it is going to be done. So once again, another example of platform as a service. All right, so I think that pretty much clarifies what platform as a service is. Let's go to that last cloud model, which was infrastructure as a service. Well, I actually jumped the gun there. I wanted to ask you guys if you remember what IAAS stands for. 
But okay, well, accidentally gave the answer away. So IIAS is infrastructure as a service. All right, so with infrastructure as a service, this is probably the most flexible category of the cloud services. So what is meant by that is you've got the most control. So we've said earlier, and I'll say it again, software as a service is the one that's the most restrictive. Doesn't mean you don't have any access or any control, but where you are going to relinquish the most amount of control. Where you've got the least amount of control. Platform as a service, which was the previous topic, is smack bat in the middle, so that's the middle ground. So you've got a little bit more control compared to software as a service. And then lastly, our third one, infrastructure service, here you've got the most control. Now, we're certainly not saying you've got full control, definitely not, definitely, definitely not, but you've got the most control with this one. So it aims to provide you with complete control over the hardware that runs on the application. So you cannot physically touch the hardware or the operating system and all that, but you get to choose the hardware, for the most part at least. You've got about 80, 90% control, and their aim is to try and give you full control. So... Even though you can't physically see it or physically touch it, you can choose the hardware. I can choose how much RAM this machine has. Uh, let's assume it's a virtual machine because a virtual machine is actually a very good example of infrastructure service. A virtual machine running in a cloud on some platform like that Azure portal I just showed you guys is a very good prime example, very common example of infrastructure as a service. And that virtual machine, I can now go and choose the RAM it has, CPU, you know, how many virtual CPUs it has, how much hard drive space it has, I've got control over that. And never mind choosing the hardware, I can go and choose exactly which operating system I want to install. And once you've installed the operating system, you've got 100% full control over the machine from there. So the benefits is you've got a heck of a lot of control. The drawbacks, of course, is if you've got so much control, that of course means there's more things that's going to be your responsibility. You are in charge of making sure it's highly available. You are in charge of making sure backups take place. I mean, heck, if that virtual machine needs a virt you know, an antivirus of some kind, you are going to have to do that. Microsoft's not going to go and do that, or whoever your cloud provider is. If it's Amazon, Amazon's AWS, those guys are not going to take care of that. It is your responsibility. You are going to have to configure the firewall. What do you do it on the virtual machine itself? What do you do it on the cloud platform itself? Yes, you do get firewalls on the cloud platform, in case you're wondering. It's all your responsibility. So each and every one of these cloud solutions comes with its own unique benefits. They come with their own unique drawbacks. One of the main benefits I love about cloud, and all of these cloud providers will probably brag about that a lot, is the fact that it's very cheap. It's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. It's really cheap, really affordable. It's going to save you and your company a heck of a lot of money. Tons of money, in fact. Now, these cloud providers will probably allow, you know, love for you to believe that everything in a cloud is going to be sunshine and rainbows, it's always going to be cheaper and always going to be more reliable. And usually, yes, but I wouldn't fully agree with that. I mean, there are cases where I've seen it actually is slightly more expensive or something, but that's a story for a different day. That's something for more for like a cloud course, of course. Now, speaking of examples, which I mentioned earlier already, virtual machines, as I've said, are a common example of infrastructure as a service. So with that in mind, I think I'm going to go back to that cloud portal of mine, which I just showed you guys, so just one second. All right, folks, here we are back on our cloud portal. And if you're wondering why, it is because I would like to give you guys another example, just to really enforce this. So if you have something like a virtual machine running on your laptop, your desktop, or even your company's service, that is just infrastructure because it's running on your property or your company's property. But if you were to take that same virtual machine and upload it to a cloud platform, like this one where I am right now, this Microsoft Azure portal, if I upload the virtual hard drive, because that is something you can actually go and do, or if I go and create a virtual machine from scratch in the cloud, that, folks, is an example of infrastructure as a service. So with that in mind, let's go back to that navigation menu. Here we have virtual machines. Yeah, let's go click on that a little weasel. Give it a moment or two. Here you can see I've got five virtual machines running this. Four of them has got Windows 10 installed. One's got a Windows 11 installed. That's besides the point, though. I'm going to go click on Create just to show you what you've actually got control over. I'm going to click on New Virtual Machine. Give it a moment or so to load. And there we go, guys. So here, just to, just to give you guys a taste, I've got all kinds of tabs of all kinds of aspects of this machine I can go and configure. And no, it's not a matter if you can only configure this when you're creating the machine. Pretty much all of this can be configured even after the machine has been created. So whether we're talking virtual machines, whether we're talking something else, 
most things can be configured either while the component is being created, which in this case is a virtual machine, or after. So if I scroll down here, we're not going to discuss all of that. That's more for you know Azure or Cloud course. You can go check out my cloud videos if you're curious about this. Maybe go check out my Azure Fundamentals course. It's AZ900 in case anyone's wondering. But getting back to the virtual machines, I can choose the virtual machine's name, just like you can do on premises. I can go and choose the operating system, just like you can do on premises. There's a very, 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 very large list or repository of operating systems you can go and choose. Pretty much anything you can imagine, you can go and install. Hardware-wise, I can choose the specs. So I've got all kinds of packages here. So if I were to go click here on see all sizes, you'll find they've got categories here. And depending on what category you click on, they have all kinds of specs you can go and choose from. How much RAM do you want? How many hard drives do you want? Hard drive speed, you know, temporary storage. It's going to show you how much it's going to cost you, you know, in your currency. That's my currency. It's going to show you how much it's going to cost you in your currency. That is assuming it's running 24-7 day and night. So if you're going to turn that machine off at some point in time, it's probably going to be less than whatever that value is in your currency. So whatever currency is, it's probably going to be less than that. You only pay for what you use in the cloud. That's another benefit of the cloud. It's not part of this course, but I'm throwing it in there since you guys might be curious. If I turn a virtual machine off or whatever this component is in the cloud, I'm not using it, which means I'm not using this cloud provider's RAM, not occupying you know, any of their CPU you know, cycles, none of that. So if I'm not using their resources, I'm not paying for it. So that's a benefit. But if it's a server, you know, realistically, can you really turn it off? Probably not. So yeah, I mean, that's just to show you guys, you can actually have full control over this machine if it's running in the cloud. All right, let's go back to that presentation. All right, so here we are. I actually want to go to the next slide here. Um, a comparison is what I want to go and do. So looking at this table of mine, way there on the right, you'll see there's a category that says on-premises in green. So look at the top right, it says on green. So if everything is on-premises, imagine you've got a server on-premises. It doesn't really matter what the purpose of that server is. Let's just say you've got a server on-premises that's rendering some sort of service. What is your responsibility and what do you have control over? Well, everything is your responsibility and you've got full control, 100% control. Now, looking at this table, you can see we've got less and less and less control the more we move towards the left. Infrastructure as a service is the one we've got the most control, but not full control. Things we do not have control over, if you look at infrastructure services at the bottom, is the networking. You cannot physically touch the networking. You cannot go and plug cables in or plug them out and that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean you have zero you know, uh, control. You have some control. You can go and configure the networking, IP addressing, subnetting, firewalls, VPNs, that kind of stuff. So that's about a 50-50. Storage-wise, same story. You cannot physically touch it. It's a 50-50. Service-wise, you can go and control you know, what hardware needs to be in there, but you cannot physically touch it. It's a 50-50. Virtualization, they will do that for you, and then the rest of that stuff, well, that you've got full control over. Anything beyond that, you've got full control. Once the machine has been virtualized, if it's something like a virtual machine, from there on forward, you've got full control. If you look more towards the left there, left there with platform as a service, you can see with platform as a service, we don't have control over the operating system. We don't have control over the middleware or the runtime. We basically just have control over or access to the end result, like that Active Directory we showed you guys earlier. And then lastly, way there on the left, software as a service, we've got the least amount of control. Pretty much almost none. You literally just have control or access to the end result, which is the actual software itself. You definitely do not have access to even the operating system that runs on. Very, very middle, minimal control you guys have. All right, folks, so that actually, in a nutshell, is the three main cloud models. I hope that makes a little bit more sense to you guys. If it doesn't, feel free to comment down below and let me know if one of them doesn't make sense. Maybe I can give you a better description in the comment section. If you've got a question about anything we've discussed in the video, maybe something else related to the video, feel free to also maybe drop that in the comment section down below. Whatever. You know, I'll normally try and respond within 24 hours. All right, if you've enjoyed this video and if you've liked it, if you've learned something, please give the video a like. If you'd like to know when the next lesson comes out, the usual subscribe button is there if you guys want to go and use it. And then lastly, folks, the usual thank you. So thank you very much to the sponsors of this channel. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. And if you guys would like to do the same, you can find all of that information in the video description down below. All right, guys, see you in the next lesson.